So identity politics, what if I'm racist? So hey y'all, welcome back to the vlog and our week-long discussion of identity politics or at least just, you know, allowing identity politics to kind of shape the discussions for this week. Um, I'm having this. No, don't get excited. I know that there are some of you who um, last summer remember that there was like a watermelon mukbang every, every Sunday and those were awesome and that's coming back. I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. But the, you know, the format, I'm playing with the format and so you guys seem to like these, you know, chat style videos. And so I'm gonna keep the chat style videos going and talk about stuff. Um, I didn't make a tea today. I was gonna have this licorice, that licorice tea that I had the other day, but you know, I didn't make it. I didn't get it made. A lot of stuff is happening. So I'm packing up and I'm getting ready to leave Brooklyn, head back to Detroit. Um, some of you remember during the fundraiser, one of the things that um, was on the budget for the fundraiser last winter was, you know, doing some flood mitigation and it just wasn't possible. It wasn't possible. So that's going to get done. Actually, now there's actually, there's, um, there's someone going in to do some, you know, some, you know, snaking out of the drains and likely it looks like I'm going to need new pipes. And I think the budget for all of that was somewhere around $900. It turns out it might, it could cost as much as $6,000 to get the job done. I'm not going to do a fundraiser. I'm not going to do a fundraiser. And that is because the project itself is has been really lucrative this year. I've had enough folks coming that the project is, um, is, has been pretty sustainable. I'm really, really excited about that. Um, it looks like next winter though, we probably aren't going to have programs running all winter. It just was very, very difficult. It was far more in terms of utilities and things like that. And until um, there's some more sustainable utilities attached to the house, like solar, um, power, solar, you know, heating and things like that. I don't want to just be, you know, using gas and coal and other dirty forms of energy to, you know, heat this space that is really dedicated to sustainability. So that's, that's what's going on there. But I'm really excited to be getting back to the official alt space space. Um, uh, so people have been asking me about um, a P.O. box. What do you guys think? If I had a P.O. box, would you send me stuff? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like, I don't need stuff, but you know, I'll send you stuff. If you send me stuff, I'll send you stuff, but I need to get a post office, post office box to make that more possible. Someone recently um, uh, contacted me about a book that they had gotten an extra copy of, and it was a subject that I was really, really interested in. And you guys, I'm doing this without notes today, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, I don't have the name, but I will be thanking that person. Um, I'll be thanking you when the book comes. I'm going to give you a big, a, a, a big fat thank you. So yeah. So let me know, guys, if if you think it's worthwhile getting a po post office box for the channel at this point. What else? News, you guys. Been catching up on the news. A lot has happened in the world. particularly in the U.S. with our president. Um, the I word, and if you don't know what the I word is, you probably want to go ahead and just check the news. Um, the I word is being thrown around now in terms of um, our, you know, President Donald Trump. And that's along with so many horrific things that are happening in the world. Um, North Korea tested a new missile that traveled 400 miles, which gives them the capability to attack U.S. targets. Um, and those, um, the missiles that they were using were, you know, could be, you know, they could have, you know, they could carry nuclear warheads. So, um, so that's a little, something a little shaky in the world. But in the meantime, instead of our president being able to kind of focus in on those things, our president is engaged in a major political scandal right now. The president of the United States is engaged in a major political scandal. So for those who've been following that, um, yeah, just please, if you're, please be following that. 
Um, also, just in terms of the world, um, not taking care of very good, um, not taking very good care of the planet. Apparently, a subsidiary of Dow Chemical has been trying to get a new, basically, an insecticide on the market that the EPA has been fighting and other environmentalists have been fighting. It's a pretty toxic chemical and. Um, recently, the EPA, in their first decision since Donald Trump became president, um, approved this new drug. And so this month in California, a bunch of workers were exposed to it and had to be hospitalized. So not looking so good. Our environmental protection agency um, under Pruitt is not necessarily going to be looking out to protect the environment or the people who work with, you know, potentially hazardous chemicals. Um, here's the sad part is that I discovered that um, the company had actually been conducting research for years in poor urban communities using the insecticide to kill, you know, insects in people's homes. And apparently the individuals who are exposed to it, primarily children, have shown all kinds of late cognitive disorders because of it. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, lowered IQs, whatever that means. And, you know, they're still doing studies to find out exactly what the effect of the chemical is. But it was very, very clear that this was a dangerous chemical. And now it's been released on the general population thanks to our current administration. So that makes me a little bit sad. That's an understatement. Um, yeah, identity, identity politics. So one of um, one of the viewers um, turned me on to a video that they had actually made, and they were talking about the way that people who maybe are seen as racist or maybe as seen as anti-progressives are treated within a progressive community and how you have certain voices that are being silenced, you know, just being silenced. And I, and I consider that, you know, bad behavior on the part of those individuals who want to silence people. Um, now I'm a little bit on the fence in terms of like, if you're, if, you're, um, if you're scheduled to appear at a college and the students at that college protest because they don't want that speaker to appear, you know, they're the customer. They're paying money to attend a university and they have the right to say whether or not they want that person to speak at their university because it does, it does um, in some ways um, speak to the support of the university. It's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a way of saying that the university supports that in individual, you know, and and in and in that case, there you know people students are also free to say, well, no, we want that individual. And so, if you have a situation where you have students saying yes, we want that person to come and speak, and you have students saying no, they don't want that person to come and speak, there's a, an opportunity for dialogue there. Um, certainly, I don't feel like being protected from words is a way to make the world a better place. I don't agree with that. Um, but I do think again, like if, you know, I, I get to say who comes in my house, <laughs> you know, I get to say who comes in my house. And if I'm a student at a university or if I'm a member of a, an organization, I feel like the members of that organization have every right to say, no, we don't want that person to speak. And they can either invite them or not invite them. And in universities, it gets a little, you know, and eh, 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 because the administration may invite someone or someone who's a donor may ask that someone be invited, but the students who should be, you know, at the center of that experience of university life, because they're the customer, um, should get to say no. But um, what I want to talk about is 
those who openly identify as, say, ethno-nationalist, those who are members of the KKK, those who are, um, you know, outspoken, outspokenly racist, um, how they fit into identity politics. Something funny, Donald Trump giving a speech, I believe he was giving a speech at a, at a university, like Liberty University or something like that. And he was, you know, basically saying he's been the worst treated, he's the worst treated president in the history, in U.S. history or something like that. Forgive me for paraphrasing, but, um, you know. We're talking about a, you know, a country that has a history of, you know, assassinating presidents. So, Trump, you've got a ways to go. I, I hope that you're not ever uh, in the position that you can, you, that you have the same beef that, say, John F. Kennedy had or Abraham Lincoln had, right? I hope that you never, or Ronald Reagan, right? I hope that you are never in the position where you can say that you were treated unfairly in that regard, right? And so, you know, you're, you're kind of lucky that people are just you know, complaining about your your track record and the things that you do and the things that you say. And, and those things are, you know, have come under scrutiny and maybe more than for other presidents. But, you know, I think most of us who have any kind of political memory um, remember George Bush and how he was mocked, mocked. You know, I think that people can, you know, people can remember how George Bush was mocked. And to this day, you know, people are, you know, there are books about Bushisms, right? So, um, you know, you're in good company and you're the, you're the president of the United States and you've gotten and, and, and Donald Trump has gotten on, on television and said many times, hey, I'm the president. I'm, I, I can do whatever I want, right? He's bragged about his, his, um, his very, very powerful status in the world right now. So when the president starts whining about mistreatment, I think we're in trouble. <laughs> I think we're really, really in trouble. Um, when the president starts crying, you know, I'm a victim, I think we're in trouble. And um, so this is a little bit um, how I feel about, you know, you know, if you're a neo-Nazi and, you know, you want to have your, suddenly you're trying to have your freedom of speech protected, what does that mean? Legally, you can say what you want to say. The state is not going to come down on you for, you know, saying something that is racist. In fact, we see that you can say something that's racist and still become president of the United States, right? So, or sexist, right? So, so let's not go there. Let's not pretend that that's as far as it is. And let's not pretend that we don't have, you know, centuries to go, right? Before we're at a place where racists don't feel fairly safe in the world to express their racism. And if you want to, you know, an example of it, you can, you know, look through my comment section, right? And like, whatever, it's whatever, it's whatever. But um, that is a group that seems to want to benefit from the same protections as other groups. Um, and they want to use the politics of identity to achieve um, those those protections, right? And I think, you know, sure, they have the right to do that. I certainly would want to see it demonstrated how these groups are, you know, really under threat. And then, this is where all y'all gonna get mad at me. I want to talk about this whole idea of being whiteness and the identity of whiteness and the politics of identity around whiteness. We talked a little bit about this yesterday and there weren't a lot of comments that were made. It was deflected. Some people talked about some other things and it's sort of like, well, wait a minute. I mean, this is the United States and if you're not in the U.S. and you're not quite clear on what I'm talking about, you can go back and you can look at U.S. history and you can look at um, laws that were, you can look at um, uh, policies that were passed in the law making bodies of the colonies, right? You can look at the Virginia General Assembly, you can look at the Maryland General Assembly, and you can see that there are laws specifically created to benefit those who were identified as white, all right? So we have a very, very clear 
identity politics in place that is for the benefit of one particularly particular group at the expense of another. And so, oh my goodness, just spilled watermelon all over me. And so, when we're talking about whiteness and the identity of whiteness, sure, most people aren't aware. I'm guessing most people aren't aware that whiteness was this thing that was invented specifically to privilege some members of the society over other members of the society. I'm sure there are lots of people who don't know that or don't understand that it was something that was done very specifically. It wasn't like kind of or like it wasn't like, you know, people liked you or didn't like you. If you were someone who could be identified as white, you had the right to kill someone who was uh, identified as non-white. And um, the person who was non-white couldn't lift a hand. Um, for lifting a hand against uh, a person who was non-white, lifting a hand against someone who was white, this was the law, um, would, would receive 30 lashes on their bare back. These are things that were written into laws with, again, particular benefits and particular pen penalties. If you owned a slave and your slave was killed, you got money for that. You got money for that, right? So there were there were benefits, and there were um, there were um, penalties for depending on what group you belong to, and that's identity politics. That's identity politics in action, and so maybe it's this understanding, at least in the United States, maybe it's this understanding of the way identity politics. Uh, identity politics has have uh, have been or has been manifested in our culture that makes it so uncomfortable for people because they only understand it as this thing that privileges some and punishes others. I particularly believe that you can have identity politics that just cease to say the removal of policies that may uh, adversely affect the members of one group disproportionately, or you could have that changed so that it doesn't disproportionately affect the members of a particular group without trying to privilege anyone. And of course, if you're someone who feels like you have been privileged, then it may feel like you're being penalized as those privileges are taken away. But again, for someone to be privileged, it means that someone is going to have to, you know, go be without that privilege, right? So if someone is going to, if eating becomes a privilege, that means it, eating can only be a privilege if, if there are other people who can't eat, right? And so, you know, I think that th that's something to be understood about, you know, the privilege, uh, the privilege aspect of identity politics. So, yeah, so I'm not necessarily into an idea of identity politics that privileges some or o over others. Um, but I do believe that ident an identity politics that sees to the removal of penalties that adversely affect one group over others. So that said, what are the ways that someone who is, say, a racist, you know, by, you know, self-defined, as a racist or someone who's self-defined as white nationalist, um, what are the ways that that group might be penalized? Is it that, you know, we want them to be able to say, you know, say whatever it is that they want to say anywhere? You know, sure, yeah, that's that's fine. But I don't think that we should be protecting the white nationalist right to live in a white America. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Are we? Are, are, do we agree with that? Do we agree that we don't want you know the neo Nazi to live in a world where there are no Jewish people? Right? I think that we. I think when we talk about protecting the rights of you know racist and neo nationalist and all those folks, that what we're not talking about giving them what they want in any way, like not even giving them like a, a neighborhood, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's like, there should be no neighborhood where uh, some people are allowed to live and other people are not allowed to live, right? That's not the kind of world that I want to live in. But maybe, maybe people do feel like that is indeed the case. And if you do feel that way, let's talk about it. I'm not, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to 
dismiss someone's point of view uh, just because I disagree with it. So yeah, yeah. So again, that's the other side. For me, I consider it the like, the dark side of identity politics. And the truth is, you don't have to be white to have those beliefs, right? You can be someone who, um, or you don't have to identify, self-identify as white, right? Because there's also this reality where, you know, really no one's white, right? But if you identify as white, I can't, I don't want to hate on you because you identify as this thing that we understand was created to have a particular effect, right? Because most people don't understand that that's what it is. So they're identifying as white because that's, that's just who they are, right? In the same way as like I might identify as a fag, even though, you know, being identified as a fag might be you know, something negative to some people, right? But I, you know, I should get to identify the way I want to identify without somebody else telling me, well, you can't identify that way because whatever, whatever, right? So that's that. But um, I do think that people who, you know, there are people who could be identified in, in many different ways who might feel like, you know, other people don't deserve to live. And I don't agree with that, right? So, so just making sure when we talk about identity politics and we talk about um, the usefulness of identi identity politics to me is ensuring that the members of certain groups who may be tar targeted disproportionately by certain policies, right, um, can be, are not necessarily protected in any special way, but that everyone is protected so that what is happening to that particular group can't happen to anyone, right? And that we're not talking about conferring upon particular groups benefits, right? And that starts to look very different ways, right? So, you know, it starts to look in very, very different ways. And so uh, I think that that's where the conversation can begin. I mean, obviously there are people who look at, say, you know, affirmative action and if you look at affirmative action as privileging people of color over other people, then that's wrong. If you look at affirmative action as the removal of any policies that would prevent someone of a particular color or gender or orientation or religion or age from not having the opportunity, uh, um, for not getting the fair opportunity at being hired in that job, then I think that you know version of affirmative action is is useful and valid. So many things. That was a lot to talk about. So um, that's where I'm going to leave it today. I'm looking forward to your feedback and thank you all who've left, you know, all kinds of links and things for me to review. I'll be talking about some of those um, tomorrow and then uh, obviously during the live stream as we are coming already to a close on our week focused on identity politics. So that's it for this video. Like it if you like it. Share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourself. Peace. And I love myself.